Welcome to the Hardware Unbox News Corner, a new weekly segment where we'll be going through some of the bigger news topics we come across and giving some thoughts and opinions along the way. You guys often ask us to cover or comment on various news stories, so now we are, I guess. So I figured I'd kick things off with a look at the biggest game launcher of the week, which was Kingdom Come Deliverance. Probably not the most anticipated launch for a lot of you guys, but it did develop a niche following among those interested in its take on medieval, strictly no magic or fantasy RPG. It was also crowdfunded to the tune of 1.1 million pounds, so there was certainly a lot of demand for this sort of thing among those who like to crowdfund games, I guess. Anyway, the game came out earlier this week on February 13, and early opinions from critics and users seems to be mixed, tending on positive. Sounds like the game is extremely buggy though, and that's despite an enormous 23 gigabyte day one patch fixing a lot of the pre-launch issues. It could take a couple of weeks for even game-breaking bugs to be addressed, so if you're thinking of playing the game, it's probably best to wait until those glaring issues are fixed. As for gameplay, people who know the game is designed to be realistic are quite pleased with the results and the flexibility of the open world, though I've seen a couple of complaints about the restrictive save system and difficult lock picking. While it's not something Steve or I have played yet and we are exploring whether it's worth benchmarking, we have heard the top visual quality settings are quite demanding on PC. Let us know your experiences with the game and what it's like to play it and you know whether it's worth a look on our test systems from a benchmarking perspective. There's been a bit of mixed news on this next topic relating to NVIDIA's Turing graphics cards that are rumored for launch next month. Initial reports suggested it would be just another line of consumer cards or perhaps a codename for a single card, but the latest information claims is actually a cryptocurrency mining specific line or architecture. There's basically no information to go on at this stage, aside from discussion around the code name that references, of course, famous computer scientist Alan Turing. It's also made more confusing with all the discussion around Volta and potentially Ampere as well. Again, we don't know much about either of those architectures either, or you know, even whether Ampere really is the replacement for Pascal, and we suspect probably not in that case. Anyway, back to Turing. If this really is a cryptocurrency mining architecture, a couple of things spring to mind. Firstly, of course, it's great news for gamers because, you know, provided it's actually popular among crypto miners, it might ease the demand for gaming GPUs and allow gamers to actually buy cards at half reasonable prices. However, it does have to make sense for miners, otherwise they'll just keep buying consumer GPUs, so it needs to provide significantly more mining performance for the price while also offering resale value. Not 100% sure how they'd achieve something like that or whether you know, we might see mining restricted cards for gaming at the same time, but if the rumor is true, it's nice to see NVIDIA actually working on fixing the mining issue and they might even be able to cash in a bit here. I don't expect a lot of you guys to actually be running Intel's integrated graphics for gaming, but I did think this story on their latest drivers was pretty interesting. So with the 15.65.3.4944 driver, and I think Intel could probably simplify their names here a little bit, they've, they've added an ability to auto-configure game settings for the best performance on the integrated GPUs, and that's similar to what we've seen already in NVIDIA GeForce Experience. So at the moment, this feature is listed as a beta, and it only works in 12 games, which does include popular tiles like GTA V, Overwatch, and Dota 2 but it surprisingly misses out on games like Fortnite. Obviously, this is a very early project for Intel and they're, you know, they're looking for feedback on how it works and what games to add. So if you do have an integrated graphics chip that you game on, probably worth giving it a look. The iGPUs Intel are supporting with the feature anything sixth gen or newer, and that includes the upcoming eighth gen core processors with Radeon RX Vega M graphics. And that's probably why they've launched this auto configuration feature. So, you know, those buying systems with the much, much more powerful Vega integrated graphics can quickly configure game settings for the best performance on these chips. Personally, I think configuring games is all part of the fun of PC gaming, though you know, a lot of people just like having that quick and easy utility. Just launch games and play with a more console-like experience. That's fine, as long as the utility works well and doesn't suggest settings that will you know, make you run at horrible quality or sub 30 FPS. And I think with a bit of work and a few extra games added into the mix, this could be quite good for those who like to game on integrated graphics. 
Earlier this week, hopefully you saw our coverage of Raven Ridge and the new Ryzen 5 2400G and Ryzen 3 2200G. Well, just shortly after those APUs launched, a couple of new APUs were spotted in an ASRock AM4 CPU support list, the Ryzen 5 2400GE and the Ryzen 3 2200GE. Details are slim at this stage, but it seems these APUs are low power variants of the same silicon, capping the TDP to 35 watts instead of 65 watts, and reducing base frequencies from 3.5 and 3.6 gigahertz on the CPU to just 3.2 gigahertz. AMD hasn't officially announced these parts yet, but they do make sense, particularly for small form factor builds that can't fit in massive coolers. Reducing the TDP to 35 watts and allowing a less capable, smaller cooler to do the job would be great in some use cases. I do expect most of you guys building Ryzen APU systems will stick to the non-E models for the most part though. And we have also already seen these APUs scale quite well at lower TDPs. Ryzen Mobile APUs are 12 to 25 watts and use basically the same chips though they do push CPU clock speeds down even further than these E parts. Ryzen Mobile's game performance is still very good though, so expect similar from these E series parts. No word on an official launch date or pricing at this stage for them though, so keep an eye out you know, in a couple of weeks. Intel quietly pushed out the Core i3-8130U this week, a new 15 watt laptop CPU for ultra portable devices. Like the 8th gen Core i3 line on desktops, which are basically quad core Core i5s in the previous generation, this new Core i3-U series CPU is basically a dual core Core i5 from the previous gen. It has two cores and four threads with a base clock of 2.2 gigahertz and a boost clock of 3.4 gigahertz. It's not just a straight rebrand of 7th gen parts though, Intel has gone with a lower base clock than the old Core i5 line, but pushes the boost clock up a bit. Something like the Core i5-7200U used a 2.5 GHz base and 3.1 GHz boost, whereas you know, here we're looking at 2.2 GHz base, 3.4 GHz boost on the same core and thread count. The Core i3-8130U also packs 4 meg of L3 cache up from 3 meg and now supports DDR4 2400 up from DDR4 2133. And of course the integrated GPU is unchanged. It's not the biggest news, but it does allow 8th gen CPUs to filter down to cheaper ultra portable laptops. Most of the high end stuff will still use the much faster quad core CPUs, though Core i3s occupy you know, an important place for those mid tier laptops and having current gen dual cores makes sense in that category. Moving on into a bit of phone SOC discussion for a brief moment, this week a number of websites got their hands on the Qualcomm Snapdragon 845 for some early benchmarking with a Qualcomm reference design. If you aren't familiar with the smartphone SOC landscape, the Snapdragon 845 is the upcoming high-end SOC from Qualcomm, and that's set to replace the Snapdragon 835 that was widely used in flagship phones. We should see the Snapdragon 845 in most top-end phone launches in 2018. If you're interested in a deep analysis of the performance, there's no better site than Anantec for that, but I'll summarize their findings here. CPU IPC appears to be improved by around 26% relative to the Snapdragon 835, which when paired with the higher clocks delivers you know, around a 45% boost in floating point performance and 31% in integer. System benchmarks didn't show as large of a gain in a lot of tests, but it's still impressive. On the GPU front, it looks like we get roughly 30% more performance from the new Adreno 630 with higher frames per watt, which is always very important with smartphone form factors. And Nantec also found similar overall power consumption to the Snapdragon 835 in a very brief test, so that should mean excellent battery life and much improved efficiency when considering the improved performance. Something to look out for in 2018. A couple of other interesting topics to round out today's video, starting with the news that pirates have crashed Microsoft's universal Windows platform protection. PC gamers will be familiar with UWP as it's the way Microsoft package and distribute their first party games exclusively through the Windows Store, which is almost universally hated by gamers and one of the key reasons we avoid benchmarking with UWP games. It basically sucks. Anyway, so the UWP protection system has been cracked starting with Zoo Tycoon Ultimate Animal Collection, which obviously everyone was eagerly waiting to be cracked. Apparently the game was protected by five layers of DRM, including Arxan Anti-Tampa, the Microsoft Store, UWP Systems, and Xbox Live. It's not clear whether this means all UWP games can now be cracked, but at least one has, and that usually means the floodgates have been opened. 
We don't advocate for piracy here at all, so please buy games and support developers if you want to play their stuff, but it's always interesting when increasingly tough DRM is cracked these days. Speaking of UWP games, we now have the full system requirements for Microsoft and Res Xbox and PC game Sea of Thieves, which is launching on March 20th. Rather than just giving basic minimum and recommended specs, Rare has delivered six full configurations that should deliver performance anywhere from 540p at 30fps to 4K 60fps depending on the listed hardware and quality levels. Those with Intel integrated Iris Pro 6200 graphics from the Broadwell era or Iris 540 from Skylake should be able to run it at a meager 540p and 30fps. In more modern terms, this should mean it's playable on Ryzen Mobile, but not on Intel 8th Gen CPUs. 720p 30fps requires an Intel Q9450 or AMD Phenom 2, and either a GT1030 or R7450 in modern GPU terms. 1080p 30, medium quality, can be achieved with an i3-4170 and a GTX 1050Ti or RX 460. 1080p 60 at medium, that needs an i5-4960 with a GTX 1060 or RX 470. And then pushing up to 4K 30 with Ultra, they suggest a GTX 1070 or RX Vega 56. And if you want 60 FPS, you'll need a GTX 1080 Ti or a Vega 64. There's always a couple of strange things in these specification lists, particularly as they suggest a GTX 1060 for 1080p 60 FPS gaming at just medium settings, but then apparently only a GTX 1070 is required for 4K 30 at Ultra. So a little bit odd there. Oh, and the game asks for 60 gig of drive space, so expect a fairly large install size. Final brief topic for this week, ASUS has launched the ZenBook 13 UX331, which is a 13-inch ultra-portable with a Core i5-8250U and NVIDIA GeForce MX150 graphics. It's extremely rare to see discrete graphics in a 13-inch slim and light laptop, but ASUS has done it with this new ZenBook, so it's now available for about US dollars if anyone is interested. That's it for this week's News Corner. I'll hopefully be back next week with a look at whatever pops up between now and then. Let us know what you think of doing a weekly news segment below, and I'll catch you next time.